Hello, everyone. Today is Wednesday, October 9th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I really mean it. And um, I'm actually out of Mountain Dew, so I'm going to have a little community coffee, which is um, best coffee in the United States. I was going to say best coffee in the world, but I got to thinking, I don't know, there's some pretty good coffee out there, especially in Italy. So uh, I'm going to hold off on saying that. But, uh, hey, community coffee out there, I am a, uh, I'm an advertising whore. I'll advertise for anyone who uh, I believe in, of course, who has a nice uh, caffeinated drink. Hmm. God, that's good stuff. I'll have to make a bet with some of you guys one day, and if I lose the bet, I'll send you some community coffee from New Orleans. All right, there's a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up for you really quickly. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. Sometimes there's more people here than there are reviews on Amazon, so I know somebody's holding out on me. Uh, the reason I beg for a review, obviously, for vanity purposes, um, and to make myself look good. But if you really did like the book, then by all means, put me up a review. Also, as I say each week, or often each week, I should say, or almost each, each week, sometimes there's some malignant people out there that review book reviews instead of actually bothering to read the books. I can't imagine being around one of these persons. Anyway, um, even if you disagree with everybody, every, even if you just agree with everyone else and say, hey, I agree with them, then um, that's all that's really necessary. I appreciate it. Anyway, enough of my bagging. All right, what do we talk about? Well, obviously, we want to talk about emerging trend patterns from all-time highs. And um, we talked about this a little bit last week, and it's still very much relevant. So I want to follow up with that. I want to follow up on doing the right thing. Um, and let's see, we need to take out this right here. We're not going to talk about doing dumb things. We talked about that a lot last week. Um, I also have uh, an IPO uh, update I want to give, or at least talk a little bit about IPOs, especially with the Baba thing out there. And there's a couple other things that uh, didn't make it to this list for some reason. Um, now, we talked about this last week. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's something that, that I see as a reoccurring problem with a lot of people, or I should say a persistent problem. It's, it's They don't want to do the right thing, and it's hard to do the right thing. And the reason it's hard is because whenever you make a plan, you have to admit that there is the potential for failure. If you just buy a stock willy-nilly, then you don't have to admit that it might fail. And then if you let it go through where your perceived stop might have been, as long as you don't stop yourself out or exit the trade, then you have not embraced that loss, admitted that failure, and you live in Hopeville, okay? But you have to admit failure going in. As I've said a hundred times, sometimes in a spreadsheet, I'll fat finger and, and add an extra zero to a short or knock off a, a digit on a long, and just that one trade is just amazing that that could ruin your entire year, one trade. So you have to be really antiseptic about it, and you have to not care about the stock. I was thinking about this a couple of days ago. I was doing a little Forex stuff, and um, it's like I, don't, I cannot remember virtually any of my Forex trades because sometimes I'll buy or sell something, and I'll have no idea what I bought or sold. I'll just say, oh, that chart looks pretty good. If it's one of the more liquid currencies, then, I'm, I'm, then I might take the trade. But a lot of times I won't even remember or, or I should say no, let alone remember what I bought or sell. So you have to be antiseptic when it comes to that. Uh, playing games really helps out a lot, at least for me. And you got to figure out what works for you. Um, years ago, there was a, um, a guy I was helping out quite a bit. And what he decided to do was he went and bought him a trader jacket. If you guys have ever been on the floor, I've, I've been on the floor once, but not as a trader, as a um, as an obser as a, an observer. Okay. And on the floor, there's a law that you have, at least on NYSE, I think on all exchanges, uh, just to to keep things more gentlemanly. 
that you have to have a jacket on. Well, you get hot and sweaty on the floor, so 90% of the people wear these jackets where the back is completely made of mesh. And they're not, it kind of defeats the purpose, but I guess it's tradition. It defeats the purpose of having you look like a nice gentleman. But anyway, I digress. But this person I was working with, what he was going to do, or what he did, I should say, and it, it just worked for him, is he went ahead and he went to some place in Chicago, found him a trader's jacket, and he wears that trader's jacket when he sits down in front of his monitors to trade. And that's like a reminder of what he is and what he's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to be trading. Um, I use symbolism in my office. I have a sardine drive, which means sardines are meant to trade. And I've told the story a thousand times, but it's just, it reminds me that I'm here to trade. I'm not here to keep things. Um, sometimes you can play a game like watching a movie. And like Tyson said, it's, it's always... Um, Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, okay? But when you're watching a movie, you get a little emotional and a little caught up in things, or you might laugh or whatever, but you know that it's actually not happening in real life, and that sort of gets you through it. Um, find a way to be detached. It's, it's like I try to, and it, it almost makes me laugh sometimes, like if something's going against me, I try to say, oh, that's interesting. And, um, you know, like I said last week, sometimes when, you get stopped out of a stock, you, you're like, uh, I'll make, a, I'll say, um, good riddance in a, in a British accent or something. Everything's more fun with the British accent, right? Um, but you have to figure out what those games are for you. I mean, sometimes I'm like, look at you, you little good little stock, like you're talking to a, a young kid or a dog, and then, you know, bad stock, bad stock. You're going to have to go now. And it sounds silly, but this is what, sort of has worked for me over the years to conquer the psychological demons. And just because you decide to be a trader doesn't mean you no longer have a pulse. Same thing goes for me. Um, I still get pissed off. I still get angry. I still drop F-bombs. Um, yesterday, for instance, really got me upset for a brief period of time because, well, I let my ego get to me a little bit, truth be told, in the morning thinking like, hey, look how smart I am. Got this bow tie off these multiple peaks like I've been talking about for about a week, and I'll show you in just one second. And then what happens? The market starts selling off nicely. I'm like, look at me. I'm smart. Look at me, everyone. And then, of course, the Fed decides to do some job owning, and the market goes straight back up. And then that kind of mucked up my, uh, <laughs> my well-laid plans. But it happens, okay? Um... If you feel inclined to micromanage something, now I'm going to show you some techniques here in just one second where you are, you will require a little bit of thought, will require a little bit of action. But when I speak of micromanagement, I'm talking about you get in a position, and by the end of the day you're at a loss, and you've got like a, I don't know, let's say half a point loss, and your stop is about five points away. Well, Maybe you got in a little too early. Maybe you didn't get the timing just right. But you're in for a penny, in for a pound. Let the position work. But instead, you're a half a point down, so you decide, well, I'm out. So what happens the next day? Well, it gaps open five points. You would have hit that initial profit target. But, of course, you're out, and now you can't get back in. A lot of people say, well, just get out. You can always get back in. No, you can't always get back in. Sometimes the market won't let you back in. So what do you do? You, you jump in while it's up five points the next day, gaps up with five points higher, you jump in. Well, that might be the exact high, and, of course, it'll come right back in. Now you've, you've created a lot of animosity for yourself and a bigger loss than you would have had instead of the gain. So just figure out um, what works for you when it comes to playing games. And then if it's something that's a non-micromanagement situation, if you are fortunate enough to be in a stock and it's way up here somewhere, and you've got that trailing stop down here, there's nothing to do. Just let it go, okay? Let it go. Let it go, okay? <laughs> Learn to call versus collect, okay? As I said before, or last week, I'm a bit of a collector. Um, it's probably good that I'm married or I'd have uh, more than one car on blocks on the property, okay? Uh, so that's what I am in life, but in, in a... In the real world, I'm more of a color when it comes to not the real world, the trading world, I'm more of a color 
when it comes to stocks. I don't want to have 30 stocks in my portfolio. I want to call out bad stocks, and I want to keep the winners. So I'm only going to collect the winners, and then they're on a short leash too. As soon as they, they underperform, well, Dave, how do you measure underperformance? Well, that's simple. If they stop out, then they stop out, okay? Um. I wrote a column a couple weeks ago about how I hate stocks. And I used to love stocks. Every time I buy a stock, I'd be like, well, this company is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they're doing this and they're doing that. And look, they're even going up on the chart. And that's back when I had a little bit of fundamentals mixed in. Or logic or reasoning, I should say. And I felt great about the stock, and I felt wonderful about it. And if it went against me, I'm like, oh, well, we'll just, it'll come back and, and all these things. So I used to just love them, and I'd hate to get rid of them. Now I can't wait to get rid of them. And it's like I'm aggravated as soon as I get stopped out. Don't get me wrong. Again, I still have a, point, a pulse. But a, the second after I'm stopped out, I actually feel good. I feel this relief, and it's strange. And it'll take you a while to get there if you're newer to trading. But I feel this sense of relief like I got rid of a bad stock and now I can move on and it's no longer stressing me out. It's like years ago, I told a story a dozen times, but years ago when I wrote about my first book too, was, I called a friend of mine and we, we, um, we exchanged a lot of trading ideas. He found me through trading markets and we became friendly and he's a pretty good, uh, uh, well, he's a pretty active trader. I don't know if he was a good trader, but um, I called him one day and, and we're got to talk and what's going on and, and such and and he's I said man you seem really bummed out what's going on he goes well I'm nursing a lot of bad positions and it's like well, what the hell does that mean it's like either they hit you stop or they didn't if they hit you stop then you got to get out if they didn't then let them go and look for new opportunities either way the action you should take is not nursing a position I'm not sure how you nurse a position um, that's kind of a strange visual if you start thinking about that uh, but don't do it. Just if you got to get out, you got to get out. So learn to kind of hate stocks unless they do okay. You kind of got to be, pardon my French, a hard ass. Dude, that sounds like English. That's what my little French friend used to say. Uh, be an optimist in life. Nobody wants to be around the malignant people who review book reviews. Okay? You don't want to be around a pessimist. I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out, right? But be a pessimist. And your portfolio, at least not when it comes to your winners. I guess I should phrase that differently. Be a pessimist in your portfolio when it comes to the potential losing stocks. And just if you got to get rid of them, you got to get rid of them. Like we said last week, if you have to be a hatchet man, be a hatchet man. Pretend you're a hard arse boss and you got to get rid of those employees that aren't working and you got to keep the ones that are. And you're going to get rid of those too eventually. Every time you buy a stock, and this is something I don't want to get too philosophical on you. I guess too too late now, right? But every time you buy a stock, and I think I said this last week, know that its days are numbered. Know that you're going to be selling it someday. You're either going to be selling it at a loss or you're either going to be selling it at a gain. It's that simple. So every time you buy a stock, remember, you're getting rid of this thing. This thing is not for keeps, okay? It's not like having a child. Eh, I think I'll keep it, you know? <laughs> it is simply something you're going to get rid of. So know that going in. Or are you going to get rid of it when it turns into a small loss before that loss gets any bigger, provided you're following your rules, of course. Small loss meaning outside the normal volatility of the market, following your rules. Or are you going to let it turn into a huge loss and then have a psychological impact on your life? So think about that going in, and if it's working in your direction, then let it run. Hi, Dave. Maybe something for your webinar tomorrow. This was after the close yesterday. Why does it feel like you can ignore the news, but you can't ignore the Fed? I'll be buying tomorrow's. I'm not sure if he left off the word open or tomorrow's stocks, or I'm not sure what he's buying tomorrow's, which is today. Um, What's the old saying? Two, now, two days from now, yesterday will be today. Two days from now, yesterday will be today. Something like that. Anyway, well, can you ignore the Fed? There's an old Wall Street adage that says don't fight the Fed. 
But as far as the Fed news is concerned, yes, you need to completely ignore the Fed. So when it comes to news, read my lips. I ignore all news. Well, what about the Fed announcement? Who cares? Okay. Longer term, that's meaningless. Yes, in general, you don't want to fight the Fed. But what you do want to do is look at the charts and look at the markets and ask yourself, has anything changed? Yeah, these news events come into the market. And yeah, I knew it was the Fed yesterday. How did I know? Dave, I thought you ignored the news. Well, I saw that big turnaround like that, and I had to take a peek. And I'm like, this smells of a Fed jawboning. And lo and behold, it was, okay, when the minutes came out, I guess. But so what? Everything is still intact as far as the pattern is concerned. And if you start factoring that news in, you're going to start chasing your own tail. And just because you think the Fed is accommodative to the market doesn't mean you should rush out and buy the market for that. What you should do is follow your plans. If you have buy setups, then take them. If you have sell short setups, then take them. And frame it within the context of the market. And right now, as you'll see in one second or one minute, the market is still rolling over. Now, with that said, last week we talked about emerging trend patterns off of all-time or major highs. And when that happens, the most people are going to be trapped on the wrong side of the market. you got a market that looks like this, okay? And then it begins to roll over. Well, anybody who bought back here to right here, they're happy, okay? Anybody who bought from here to here is happy. And these are the Johnny-come-latelys. These are the people who buy at the last of the run, okay? Now, as soon as the market begins to crack, this guy is now unhappy, or these guys are now unhappy. And then they might be looking to get off at the first sign of that rollover following through. If the market begins to rally up a little bit, it gives them false hope, and they think, oh, I'm just going to hold on because it looks like it's coming back. But when that market begins to roll over from a bow tie, a first thrust, or some of my other emerging trend type of patterns, then they're going to be forced out of their position. Now, everybody else from way back here, all smiley guys, what are they experiencing? They're beginning to experience what? They're beginning to experience a loss in open profits. And every time the market makes goes further and further lower, then you have more and more people that end up at a loss. And then obviously anybody who bought prior to that level is still losing more and more open profits. Okay. So remember, everything I do from a technical analysis standpoint has some sort of basis. I'm not going to buy or sell. You know, somebody said, hey, Dave, it's a blood moon. That could be a sell signal. Well, I don't know if you could show me some psychological reasoning for that. Then maybe I can wrap my head around it. But I don't get it, okay? But I can look at a chart and see, that. well, let's see, like overhead resistance, my favorite example to use, okay? If a market bounces around in a range and then drops below the range, I know that the people who bought in this range are going to be looking to get off the hook at break even, okay? Um, now, keep in mind, when you are trading an emerging trend pattern, okay, you're still a bit of a pioneer. You're either going to get the arrows at your back or you're going to get the gold. Okay. Sometimes this is only a correction in a longer term trend. For instance, I'm always asked, Dave, what about, let's just follow the weekly chart. Well, the weekly chart, it's going to look like this on a weekly. Okay. This is a weekly and this is a daily. Okay. And a daily, it looks like the mother of all rollovers. On a weekly, it's just a bit of a pullback. Well, you can't sit around and wait for this weekly to roll over, like I said, because by the time it does, it might be too late. Although we did have some early signals in 2007, early 2008, and we did have a decent signal in the 02, 03 bottom, and we did have a pretty decent signal uh, back in 2000, way back then. So there were some pretty decent weekly signals, but in general, you don't want to sit around and wait for that weekly signal, especially on an individual stock basis. 
But again, you can be a pioneer because maybe it is just a pullback in that longer term weekly chart. Okay. So unfortunately, there's no guarantees, right? But here's the thing of beauty. Not every pattern will turn into the mother of all tops. Not every emerging pattern or transitional pattern, as I used to call them, will turn into the mother of all tops. But all tops will have a pattern. All tops will have either a first thrust or a bow tie. And those are the two most popular and two most common ones. But it could also, in addition, have a reversal gap or some other pattern like a gatekeeper or something within that top. So every one of these emerging trend patterns uh, in some variation or combination will occur at a top. So it pays to pay attention. Now, I know over the last few years, it's been a little bit tough because these signals really haven't panned out. And let me just read you something here. Um, this is something I put in my column before. It's straight from Greg Morris's book, Investing, Invest with the Trend. If you look at today's column, I've got a link to that, or look at my website for a link. Uh, active management has underperformed since the lows of 2009, but this is to be expected. Anyone who has kept paced, pace with the market the last few years should be questioned because they likely have not made any moves that would or will protect their portfolio when the next inevitable bear market occurs. That's Judd Dotery uh, from Stadium, uh, Stadium Capital Management, which is Greg's firm over there. And this is uh, from investing with the trend. And Mr. Dotery's point is that the market has ignored some sell signals over the past few years, and they haven't worked out. So the and he's referred to fund managers who have done incredibly well, and I think he's implying buy and hold. In fact, I know he's implying that buy and hold. Well, 2009 and up until now has really rewarded the buy and hold and has really put those guys back on the map. Like, ah, maybe it is a viable strategy. No, it's not, because just look back to the NASDAQ in 2000, it lost 70% of its value. Could you imagine running a tech fund in 2000 and losing 70%? Because you're buying and holding. That's what you do. That's how you roll. Okay. No, it doesn't work that way. And when we look at the P's here in a minute, you'll see... Um, obviously, there's been some pretty serious rollovers, and the market has survived. That's great. I don't care. I, I hope it goes up forever. But unfortunately, when it does begin to roll over, you're going to have to pay attention because one of these times, it's going to be the real deal. Okay? Yeah, Greg is now writing. So, oh, good. Good to know, Michael. Um, Greg is a part owner of StockCharts.com. He's a good guy. He really is. He's a. We occasionally have a beer together. I'm not saying the name drop. We're just buddies. <laughs> we think everybody, we think a lot of people in the industry are FOS, and uh, we like to drink beer. So we kind of agree on, we agree on those two things, and I think that's all you really need to agree on. Um, I left this one in from last week. Did I have a, a reason for leaving it in? Let me think. Um, I don't know why. This is sketches from last week, but it is a bow tie off of all time high. So let me just point that out to you. This market makes an all-time high, and then it bow ties down. i got to ask a few questions about some stocks that kind of look like this, and then they make a bow tie, okay? And my point is that I'd almost rather have a stock that's in a trend like this make a bow tie, because if it's wide and loose, it might roll over a little bit, but it might go back to being wide and loose, whereas if this thing begins to crack in earnest, then anyone who bought, like I said earlier, from here, and then if it gets below here, then here, or whatever, it goes further and further, is at a loss. Where if it's just wide and loose, people are like, ah, stock's wide and loose. I've seen this before. I'm just going to hang on to it. So if you are going to play a transitional pattern, I would much prefer play one, playing one in something that was in a prior serious trend as opposed to something that's been chopping around a little bit. All right, let's talk about the second mouse signal once again in the P's. There's an old Wall Street adage, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. And I call these second mouse signals, like if you have a back-to-back -back bow tie, for instance. And 
that's exactly what we have in the piece. Now, we have a double top, but Dave, the top, the right side is, is higher than the left, and it is. Uh, like I say quite often, learn technical analysis, but realize that it, ha it has its variations and its nuances. Okay, read Schaubacher, read Pring, read Murphy, read all the, the famous educators when it comes to primers and technical analysis. Uh, I don't know if I said Pring. Pring is pretty good, too, but it comes to some good stuff there. He's a good guy. Um, anyway, make sure you read those guys, and you can get all those books off my website. But that's what a double top looks like, and it makes sense. It's kind of like market gets back to its old peak, hits resistance, rolls back over. Well, a lot of times, they don't look like that, though. They look like this, okay? And that's like a gatekeeper type of pattern. Sometimes it'll develop as. And what happens here is people think it's going back to the old highs, and they think they, they feel pretty confident about it, but then it rolls over and tricks them. And then the third variation is this. It takes out the prior peak, making it look like everything is all clear, then it rolls back over. Okay? And that's what we have here, variation three, where the market got on to new highs, media has a big celebration, okay? And then it begins to roll over. Prings on stock charts? Well maybe I need to be on stock charts. Let me uh I'll call Greg when I get off. This uh, get done with the seminar, okay? I I tried to do an affiliate agreement with them, but they didn't want to. Um, but I digress. Let me shut up before I get in trouble. They'll, they'll never let me on now. Uh, anyway, so you got the higher peak here, number one. Number two, you got a bow tie down, okay? And then you could see it's beginning. Or last week it was beginning to set up. And I have, let me see if we got today's, uh, let me see something here. I wonder, I was supposed to have today's chart in here. Well, we'll look at today's chart when we get to the market. So that's what's going on there. Now, let me show you a second mouse stick. I talk about this all the time, or quite often. I talk about the top of the euro back in 2008. And this was my first trip abroad right around here, and I found out how little my euro could buy. Now, I had a sell signal back here, kind of a first thrust slash bow tie thing. It didn't pan out, as you can see. But what happened was the market ran up, and notice that it never really got past its second or its prior peak by that much. And that's the thing that you want to pay attention to with bow ties is that sometimes you'll get the bow tie signal, and that becomes either the all-time high or pretty darn close to it, okay? And in this particular case, it just kind of barely peeped up above. I guess enough just to get everybody thinking that, oh, here we go again. We're going on to make new highs. And then what happens? You get the real bow tie here. That's your second signal. And then, of course, the market implodes, and it becomes the mother of all trends in the euro. What's too blunt, Michael? Too much fun? <laughs> What's blunt? <laughs> anyway, uh, while we're waiting on Michael to tell me what's blunt, let's see what's going on. All right, uh, any questions on bow ties or transitional patterns or emerging trend patterns, whatever you want to call them, uh, before we move on to the next subject? Curious on whether you see recent increased volatility a sign of likely reversal or simply end of summer trading. Well, I'm not into seasonals. But I can certainly tell you there is a seasonal pattern. And as a general statement, and this is where you got to be careful in the markets, as general statements, they can get you a lot of trouble, okay? Just see what's actually going on on a day-by-day -day basis. But, yeah, as a general statement, the market volatility dries up during the summer months, and then it comes back around October, okay? Everybody gets back from vacation, starts trading again, and I don't know what the exact reasons are, but maybe that's it. So Phil's asking, is it reversal or simply the end of summer trading? I don't know, but I, but here's the thing. In general, when a market starts to whipsaw around, it tends to wear everybody down, and then, yeah, you'll get a reversal, okay? Now, that's a general statement, okay? I don't think you could trade off of that, but, yeah, usually when it starts getting volatile, as a general statement, your volatile moves are to the short side. 
Because if you take a look at something like the VIX, the VIX measures both the long side and the short side. People forget that, okay? You're measuring both calls and puts with a VIX. And it VIX, usually you only get a serious spike at the VIX when the market begins to sell off. Well, volatility comes into a market usually when it sells off. And then, of course, as you probably know, when that volatility gets extreme, what happens? The market begins to bounce. I think somebody emailed me a couple days ago. They, they're following my old VIX signals that I used to follow that I kind of developed slash co-developed with Larry Connors, and, and I really don't follow those anymore because I'm, oh, I want to get too focused on the short term, on the short, short term like I used to be. But there's still, still valid research, and it's still out there, and we may have gotten a signal coming into this Fed announcement. I don't know. I didn't check it. Uh, I look at it every now and then. When it starts getting really volatile, I'll start looking at the VIX again, but in the meantime, I don't, I don't use it as much as I used to and the one reason is that volatility dried up for several years and I found that the volatility stuff wasn't working as well so I, I sort of moved on from that um, but yeah I wouldn't get too excited about um, in one way or the other okay go or no go decisions um, If you guys have layman's, which I guess you do, if you, I don't know why you, else you'd be here uh, if you didn't. Uh, let's say you got a stock that's set up, pulls back, and you're looking to get in right around here. Okay. Well, if this stock gaps open to here the next day, what do you do? You don't do anything, okay? Because it's such an extreme gap, you just let it go. You don't care, okay? Now. If it gaps open to right here, as a general statement, you don't worry about it. You just go with it. It's not that big of a deal, okay? And if it gaps open a little bit above or a little bit more above your entry, you could make two decisions. One, you could say, okay, I'm just going to go with it. The gap isn't that big. Let's not worry about that gap too much. Or you could say, well, let me just see if it's going to reverse. So if it does gap open, a sizable but not a huge gap above your entry and begins to come right back in, then you avoid the trade and maybe put a second entry above that level, okay? Now, this is in layman's in the second uh, half of the book. Let's talk about a setup here. This URI was a bow tie kind of made a marginal top in here, double top or whatever. And then it sold off hard and pulled back, giving us the first thrust, okay? Now, we had an entry at 105.5, so right around it here, and a stock gapped open here. Well, that's about a point in change on a $105 stock. It comes right in at just a little bit over a percent, one percent. 1% is not that big of a move in a stock, so that's really no big deal. So you could go ahead and take that trade on the open, and you're not doing anything wrong, okay? The other thing you could do is you could wait and see, so it gaps down. Your entry's here. It gaps to here. You could wait and see if it goes down, if it starts going down. It keeps going down. At some point, you've got to make that go or no-go decision. That's why I call it go or no-go. The reason you have to make a no-go no -go decision is because sometimes markets gap lower and then it becomes a route straight down. And sometimes if you don't get in within those first few minutes, you're going to miss the mother of all moves. Let's say it moves 10 points in those first few minutes after the gap, and that's all it does for the day. Or even that might even be the end of the move. You, you get your initial profit target, maybe that's it. Okay, I've seen that happen on one day. I've seen it all, okay? You be if you if you hang around long enough, you'll see you'll see a lot of stuff. So what you do is you have to make that go or no go decision, and it's kind of hard. But as long as the gap is not too big, it's okay. Number one, to go with it on the open, and number two, go with it when it begins to drop. Okay, so even if you wait to see if it does this and it doesn't, then it's okay as it starts to drop. Now you can't let it drop, 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 drop. And then at some point say, okay, I'm going to get in. Well, at that point, it's gone too far. But let's say it drops a little bit and then it begins to reverse, okay? Now you've got two options. One, 
you could put in a, you could put in an entry stop below the low of the day, or two, you might you might get it a little bit earlier. You might look to get in on like an intraday pullback. Okay. Robert says so. Never put buy stops on before market open. That is correct. Never put buy stops in before market open. Now I do have some clients that trade my stuff on a mechanical basis just because they're off saving lives, building buildings, and repairing transmissions, and they can't watch that open. Ideally, you want to watch the open. Ninety-five percent of your discretion is going to happen around the open. So very important to watch that market open. But if you can't watch an open, it's okay to use uh, an order before the market. But I would encourage you to use a contingency order. Now I don't want to open up that can of worms because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna ask me, Dave, let's let's take a look at my brokerage and let's let's figure out how we want to do this. And it could get quite complex and each brokerage has a different contingency system and depending depending on the level of platform you have it could get even worse. But with a contingency order you could say, okay, I want to let's say I want to take this unless it goes more let's it gaps two more than two points away from the entry, then I'm not going to take it. You could put that kind of thing into a contingency order. Uh, I would encourage you first to use your brain, use your head, and actually watch the open. But I realize that everybody doesn't have that luxury. So if you don't have the luxury, then use a contingency order if you are to place orders before the open. Okay? Okay, we'll get to that in, in one second, Daniel. Um, Looks like an interesting question. I, I think I know that stock. Um, so anyway, you got to make a go or no-go decision. In this particular case, you can see that it did gap below the entry, which is right around here. So it wasn't like a huge gap below the entry. And then on an intraday basis, it did continue nicely lower until, of course, the Fed came in and mucked things up. Now, on a five-minute chart, Again, your entry was like right here. It looks a little bit more extreme on a five-minute chart. But you can see it did sell off a little bit, and then it came right back up. So if you didn't take it on the open and you waited for it to kind of to see if it was going to keep going down or whatever, you could either get in when it began to slide again, or you can get in below the low. Neither one is correct. One is more conservative. This is more conservative, waiting for it to make new lows for the day. Unfortunately, you give up. A couple of points in the trade. This is a little bit more aggressive. Look at it. Do that intraday entry. Okay. So if you miss the trade, if you didn't take it on again, if, it, if it's not that far, if it doesn't gap that far away, then you could just sometimes close your eyes and take it, knowing that there might be a chance that it might reverse on you. But you're looking at things from a bigger picture perspective. Okay. Keep in mind. You don't want to get too caught up in the minutia that happens between this level and this level when it's already gone from there all the way to there, and it sure looks like it wants to go from there all the way to there, okay? So this, and even this, is a lot bigger deal than this, okay? But it's hard. You're looking at that intraday chart, okay? And it looks like it looks like oh my god! It's like it just all looks like wow! Look at that! It's huge! It's huge! Wow! It's crazy! But it's not that crazy within context. Okay. Now this was not a cut and dry example because it did have not a huge gap, but it's a gap enough to where it, it makes you scratch your head and think, wait a minute, this gap looks kind of big. Okay. So my point is that it won't always be. Or I wanted to show an example where it wasn't such a, a perfect example, okay? So the gap was a little bit big, but it wasn't that big. But it was a little bit big to where you could say, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe I want to avoid this. And it at least made you think twice, okay? And I got a couple. Oh, by the way, if you are in a service um, and you see a stock like this that's recommended and it does gap, feel free to email me. I got a few emails on that one. You could also call me. Calling me is a little tougher, though, because uh, with emails, I can answer them a lot quicker. I could, I could blow through a, quite a few emails, but the calls, it's going to be a little hard to get through. But you can call me, too, on those situations. 
Now, the reason, again, once again, and this is why you can't have, oh, I don't trade the first half hour of trading. Well, if you're scalping all day and you find there's a lot of noise and your spreads are bad the first half hour of the day, and if you are scalping all day, God bless your little pointed head, you know, <laughs> you're going to have a very short life doing that. But um, I don't want to get, uh, I got in trouble. I, I use the word crazy ass for day traders. And the second time I used it, some guy claims that he's in a big club up in New York and he'll never listen to me again. He's a tell us whole club. Never listen to me again. And, and I just mean it as like, if that's what you do, that's what you do. It's not my way or the highway, okay? But if that's what you do and you enjoy doing it and you're successful doing it, then do it. My only point is that it's going to make you crazy at some point unless you're one of the few that could do it. I, I've had some friends over the years and business associates who have done things like um, they've been EMTs or rode on ambulances or emergency room doctors. One friend was emergency room doctor forever. He had the mentality to where he could do it. But in general, I don't think emergency room doctors last that long. At least as emergency room doctors, they, they tend to move on after a while. EMTs, I had a friend that was a, that did volunteer EMT work. He used to ride ambulances. And after a while, it got to him. You know, you can't handle all those ups and downs and adrenaline and making that many decisions. It just wears you down eventually. And I think if you're scalping all day, you're going to make yourself nuts, okay? Uh, once again, based on the magnitude of the gap, it's either a no-brainer or it's not, okay? Or somewhere in between. I guess I guess it just talked out of both sides of my mouth. So let's say you're looking to get it here and it gaps to here. That's a no-brainer. If it gaps to here, eh, you probably don't want to get in. If it gaps to here, then obviously you want to avoid the trade. So somewhere, and I probably should draw that a little better. Let's say you're looking to get it here at a gaps to here, no brainer. Gaps to here, you got to think about it. Gaps to here, uh, you probably want to avoid the trade, of course. You want to avoid the trade, okay? So, based on the magnitude of the gap, if it's an obvious ogre, then it, then it is a no brainer. So, let's say you're going to get in and the market gaps up here, just right above your entry, but then it does this. That's a no brainer, okay? Too blunt, you said it. Oh, I said something blunt? Oh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. <laughs> I see a lot of stuff in these things, okay? Who is it? Somebody said, uh, if you're on air long enough, you will say something stupid. <laughs> um, and obviously, if it keeps, if it gaps open and then it keeps on going, it doesn't make that immediate reversal, that's where it gets tough. And that's where you got to make the go or no-go decision. Okay, I tend to be more of a go guy than a no go guy. Okay, I know it goes against what I said earlier about I hate stocks, but I've learned over the years that you could. I'd rather, and, and this is going to sound kind of crazy, but in trading you make decisions, and then you have to live with your decisions, and you got to find out what your own psyche can can withstand. And for me, it's much more painful to miss a big trade, to not take the trade and watch it go up 10 points by the end of the day than it is to take the trade and get stopped out. Because if I get stopped out, I'm like, ah, so what? You suck. And a few other not-so-kind things that I'll say. And then I move on. Whereas... If I don't take the trade and it goes up ten bucks, it really, it really affects me from a psychological standpoint. Okay, now that's just me, but I, but I think that it's so hard. I don't want to make it sound impossible. The you know, people, people that know me in the industry are probably like Dave. You know, you need to be. You can't um, make it sound like it's impossible. But I want to temper everybody's expectations, and then longer term, you're going to be pleasantly surprised. So as a general statement, it's so hard to get those winners. If you have one that gaps up and provided, again, it's not too extreme, it keeps on going, it keeps on going, you don't want to miss that trade because that might be that big winner that makes your year or certainly makes your month or your week, okay? And once again, if it does kind of uh, begin to... Uh, fiddle around or whatever, however you want to look at it. Let's say it um, gaps up and, and then it gaps open and then intraday it's sort of like it does this, and it does this, it does this or whatever. 
then that's where you can make a decision like, well, I'm going to get in if it takes out that intraday high or maybe play a pattern of an intraday pattern. Okay. Any questions on that? Um, somebody asked me to see the portfolio. There it is. Um, Skechers was at with a tiny profit, this SKX, and it turned into a loss thanks to the Fed. This is a URI. It was at an okay profit too. Uh, by the way, this one did, it didn't quite get to the profit target, but it does kind of dovetail into one thing that I wanted to say. Um, when you do get into a position, and let's say your initial profit target is right here, if within one or two days it's pretty close to that initial profit target, then it's okay to take those partial profits. Unfortunately, this one didn't get quite close enough to where it was a no-brainer. It was more of a judgment call type of thing, and it really wasn't that close, but it was a pretty good profit over a couple of days. So the point is that, and let's do an example on shorts on long side. Let's say you get in here, and the market shoots up like this over two days, and then just kind of meanders or whatever. It's okay to take that profit a little earlier because sometimes this move is so, the market becomes so over overbought, or in this case oversold, that it does it is due to bounce, okay? Okay, uh, anyway, I got to see the portfolio. There it is. Uh, you can see we got some leftover longs. But, Dave, I thought you were, were bullish, were bearish. Well, I am a little bearish, I guess. I hate to label myself. Did I just say bearish? I'm bearish in the parish, as they would say in Cajun land. But we still have a couple longs in here. And I'm not going to get rid of these longs until they stop out. Okay? And we got some shorts in here. And this one's... um. This one's working out okay. I think this one had a gap. That's why it's more than a thousand bucks on that. On that. So so far so good. And we're kind of waiting on these two shorts to. Um, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully materialize for us. But anyway, for whoever was asking, that's the portfolio. Uh, you can get a recording of these shows, by the way. Every now and then, I'll put one up for free on the website. But there is a. There's storage costs and there's costs to do these webinars. So I do. I do them live for free for those that who are willing to take time and a busy schedule to be here, and I'm flattered that you're here, and that's why I'm doing them for free. Um, but there is a nominal cost in processing and all. So if you want a, a recording of it, you have to um, pay a nominal cost, which it's cheap. Hmm. All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about IPOs just because of this BABA thing. And... Um, when I did the IPO webinar back in July, I showed countless examples of this, but I was just looking at the IPOs or relative new issues, I should say, this morning. And this one kind of jumped out at me, and then there was like a dozen more because this is in the A's. And then I kept seeing more and more examples of this. One thing I talked about is a lot of times an IPO will come public and then die. I call that the die in the die, meaning that they come public and just die and keep on dying. And this is a pretty case, pretty good case of, of an IPO that came public and died <coughs> and kept on dying. And what I wanted to show you here is this is your opening range on your first day. And it never, ever, never took out that opening range. Now, what I would encourage you to do is give it at least about a week or, or uh, exactly a week before you even think about it. So if it comes public on Monday, you can't even think about trading it on Friday. You have to wait until Monday. It's got to trade for five whole days before you even think about it. Um, and you could see that even after many, many days of trading, it never did take out this opening, first day opening range, okay? And you're going to see this happen over and over and over and over again. So I'll get emails. It doesn't matter how, how much I preach this two weeks from now or a month from now or a year from now. Somebody's going to say, hey, Dave, I have some chance to get some XYZ. What should I do? And it's like, well, you know, don't put anything in it you can't afford to lose, but I would suggest that you don't try to get an IPO ahead of time, okay? Because a lot of times they just, they'll just come public and then they'll die. Now, let's take a look at BABA. And that's why I want to bring up BABA is because notice that so far, at least, it hasn't taken out its opening range. Um, I've made the mistake of, betting against big, dumb IPOs in the past, not with my own hard-earned cash, 
but by making a bet, like I said, I'd eat my hat once if Google went above 100, <laughs> and I had to eat my hat. Um, I actually did it on video, and, and about halfway through the hat, I realized that I could not eat a whole cake. It was a, we had a, a local baker bake us a, ca a cake out of um, a hat and make it out of cake, and it was pretty rich, and I was almost sick by the end of the um Webinar, but I could not make it through the entire hat. Um, I actually had it on my head, and it looked like a real hat at first. People were like, was that a real hat? I'm like, no, it was made out of cake. Anyway, um, so I don't want to make the bet that Alibaba will never go over 100 again, because it might. I mean, who knows? Who cares, right? But I certainly wouldn't get excited about Alibaba unless it got above 100, or at the least, notice the, the high close, okay? And that also happened to happen on the opening day. So at the least, it would at least have to get above 94 before it would. I would wake up a little bit. So don't buy an IPO out of the gate, okay? Um, I'm not going to bore you with too many announcements. Store is open, okay? Go to DaveLandry.com slash store. And you can get uh, there. You can get the volume one of 2014. If you like these shows, you'll love the flash drives. I have gotten. Um, I don't want to brag. I've never had a flash drive returned. I, I think I have a no return policy, though. Maybe that's why. <laughs> but uh, I've never had a complaint from the flash drives. Everybody who's ever bought a flash drive has emailed me and 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 told me how much they've they've gotten out of the uh, recordings. And a lot of people have told me too. Like when I do the stock course. In the IPO course, it's like, it's nice to be there live, and God bless you guys here for being here today. Again, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm flattered and humbled. But you tend to get a lot more out of things when you can you could watch them at your own pace, and that's what I think happens with the, um, with the flash drives and recordings. And again, like I said earlier in the year, this is, we, uh, this is the first six months of the year, and this is all, everything that we covered or not even everything. It's like once I filled the sheet up, I, I well, I expanded the sheet from from over here and then over here to add more stuff, and then it's like, okay, that's enough. I think you get the idea. So a lot of good stuff there. Um, anyway, let's just hop into the market. It's got a quick question on a, a stock that's not related to buy, sell, or hold. So let's take a look at it, uh, and then we'll jump to the overall markets. Okay, let's get the charts up, and then the question is, how would you manage a trade in a stock like Lake, trailing stop, percentage, or dollar amount? Okay, Lake. Um, well, I'd handle it like uh, any other position. It's non-optionable, is it? Um. First of all, I don't know where your initial profit target was, but you certainly want to make sure you lock that in. Uh, second, the volatility has expanded. So now you're going to have to give it quite a bit of wiggle room, and you would expect a pretty serious retrace. Now, uh, the more advanced lesson, and some people might say that's totally crazy, and that's fine if, if you don't believe – I mean – not that you have to believe. If it was optionable, there's something you could do. And you could. We talked about this a little bit last week. You could buy some lottery ticket out of the money options because what's going to probably happen is this thing is probably going to retrace, let's say, a couple of bucks on you. So if you sold at 18, knowing that it would probably at least drop to 16, okay, and then frittered away a portion of that proceeds – say the amount you would have lost on a retrace, but maybe even half that amount, on some crazy wild out-of-the-money options. That's one way to play a windfall like this. The The main way to play it, or the obvious way to play it for me, would be, just be to take those partial profits, if that's you hadn't already hit your partial profit target, and then trail a stop. But know that it's your stop is going to have to be a lot looser than it was before because the volatility has jumped tremendously. So be prepared for this stock to maybe retrace all of today's gains and then some. So you're going to have to really have a, a pretty 
wide stop on that. Um, there's nothing wrong with scaling out of a little bit more. If you're up 50% in one day, you could certainly lighten up a little bit more. So that's another option for you, so to speak. So that's a good problem to have. Congratulations, Daniel. Okay. Hey, Dave, Peter Warden mentioned two stocks. The, chart, the, the stocks, the charts were good. I buy them. How about specifically talk about if you get a big about this, if you could both move big. Okay. Uh, well, when we get to the charts, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, yeah, I prefer talking about stocks I, I mentioned as opposed to someone else. Maybe talk to Peter about those stocks. Um, let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's work our way through. Now, my lecture this morning could have just been a bunch of air, okay, and and nobody comment on that. Maybe it was, but my point was, especially with someone saying, hey, Dave, hey, Dave, what about the Fed? Let's follow the Fed. Well, it's a bad idea because sometimes you get a knee-jerk reaction to a news event, and then the technicals come right back in, okay? A uh, little bit more obvious when you have a trend. Let's say you got a solid trend, and then what happens? You get some kind of news event, and that's where sometimes sometimes that'll make a TKO, which is a beautiful pattern, okay? Um, like what was it? Uh, CLDX was it was it was it like the mother of all TKOs a while back? Um, you had this beautiful trend. Yeah, right here. You had this beautiful trend back here, and then I'm guessing this is a news event, and you had a TKO. I mean, I've kind of beat the dead horse on this the CLDX. Let me see if I can find it. Let me see if I can find a, find a before on it. Um, I've used it in so many different um, webinars. Okay. Yeah, I mean, look how beautiful this is. This was an accelerating trend. And then you had a TKO. So sometimes you get a news event and you get that knee-jerk reaction, and then the trend persists. And what did um, I quoted Greg in this morning's column? And what did I say? I forget exactly what I said. Let's see if we could. Let's see if I could find it. Oh, here it is. All the financial theories and all of the fundamentals will never be any better than what the trend of the market will allow. So a corollary to that would be, how many times I have to tell you? I do a show. That's a Skype caller. Um, so all the financial theories and all the fundamentals would ever be any better than what the trend of the market will allow. So if you're using news, then the news will only push the market as far as the market will allow. And then, I mean, you guys know I'm, I'm good friends with Greg, and, and uh, I'm always I'm just a big fan of him too, so I'm kind of a, um, a little bit of both. But I like what Greg does, where Greg will um, put up a chart, and he'll say there were two wars, there were 20-something uh, earning periods, and 9-11, uh, and he'll name all these news events and things that happened on the chart, and it's impossible to pick them out because news is noise, okay? It's a reaction to the news and not the news in and of itself, okay? So now, to me, this looks like the hook is in, okay? Because you had the bow tie. You had a nice little trigger. You had a nice little follow-through, and then all of a sudden, you big shakeout move, bam, and then what happens? It turns right back down today. I had a feeling it would turn back down, and that's why I was like, I uh, said something like, I'd be willing to bet lunch on this. But I didn't know for a fact. It could have gone straight back up. But if it did, so what? My longs would start working again, my shorts would get stopped down, and I'd go back to being a trend following moron. I don't care. But nah, I'd drop a few F bombs in between, admittedly. But you got to look at the context and take things within context. You got a bow tie down of all time highs. Plus, it's coming off of multiple peaks, okay? And we just looked at what could happen when that happens. Not every time, not all the time, but it can happen. 
you could get a pretty serious sell-off from that. Today's action is not good because you had that huge pop yesterday, and now we're coming right back in. Uh, Peter was asking about volatility a minute ago. I think it was Peter. Um, there's your answer right there. Volatility tends to resolve itself to the downside. Okay. Markets tend to, you know, what's the old Wall Street get, treat adage that uh, markets take the escalator up and the elevator down, okay? Well, the elevator goes up and down quite a bit on the way down, but for the most part, they take the elevator down, and that's where your volatility kicks in. Hopefully it makes sense. Is it the day traders that react to the news? No, it's everybody, John. Everybody reacts to the news. I mean... That email I just got, that's that's a guy who, he might be, Matt, you in here? He claims to be following my system. Well, how many times, how many times do I preach, ignore the news? And then I get an email. What about the Fed? What about the Fed news? Ignore the news. Last week, what about earnings? What about earnings news? Ignore the news. You know? What about the analysts? Ignore the analysts. Okay. Better one. It eats like a bird and poops like an elephant. Absolutely. That's the uh, that's the old stop. That's an old commodity adage. So anyway, S and P bow tie down, all time highs, double tops. How many times have I said that? Enough. Selling off today, not the end of the world, but looking a little bit ominous in here. Let's take a look at Nasdaq, and you can see it also appears to have rolled over a bit of a bow tie down. Um. Like I said earlier, the buy and hold, it's like since 2009. A new, you know, the reason technical analysis works is because a new group of suckers comes along every so often. And the market has trained anybody who came along in March of 2009 that the market just goes up forever. And it has pretty much gone up for five years. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. So when you do see these bow ties down, I'm not saying rush out, dump out your entire portfolio and, and short 100 stocks, but what you probably want to do is start paying attention to the short side and start getting very selective on the long side, okay? And then, obviously, honor your stops just in case, okay? All right, that's the NASQAQ. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Um, Russell 2000, get kind of messy in here. Rusty, Russell, Rusty, Russell 2000, ugliest of them all, and this is where it gets ugly in the Rusty. You got to back your chart out, and you got to connect the the bottoms here. Okay, we have broken down out of a one year wide and loose trading range. Okay, so anybody who bought in this trading range is now in trouble. Okay, now they've had false hope for an entire year in here saying, oh, it's coming back. Oh, oh it's, it's hey, it's, it's going to go make new highs. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's been kind of a Jackie Mason market. I said that last a couple of weeks ago, and somebody thought I said something else kind of market, <laughs> which involves a bodily emission. But no, a Jackie Mason type of market. Let me make sure I enunciate properly so nobody gets repulsed in these Presentations. As you can see, if we close where we are now, we've closed at one-year lows in the Russell. So that's pretty ugly, okay? And that, to me, looks like a breakdown. Some people are like, is it a head and shoulders top? Well, it's a complex head and shoulders top, meaning it has multiple peaks. So I just look at something like this and call it a top. I don't try to qualify it or put it in some sort of pigeonhole. All right, let's talk about a few sectors. This won't take but a minute, and then we'll get we'll hop into uh, your individual questions. Susan, uh, yeah, we'll get to you next. Um, a lot of areas have rolled over after just making new highs, sort of like the market itself, so it's no big shock or no big surprise. And then on some of these where the slide's pretty serious, it kind of forces that bow tie to happen. Uh, Chemical's a good example of that. Just made new highs, began to implode, and it looks like they're trying to make a new leg lower. Uh, I'm not going to bore you and go through too many of them. Each week, I think, we're going to spend a lot of time on the sectors, but there's really no need. Most, like the market itself, have formed uh, similar patterns. And take a look at the energies. Triple top, 
Double bow tie. Second mouse signal on the bow tie. Notice the first one really didn't trigger, or didn't trigger by much. Went right back up, and then, damn, second mouse signal there. Nice little slide in the energy stocks. Even some of these areas like health services are now beginning to look a little dubious. They sold off. They're trying to come back. Now they're kind of stalling short of their prior highs. Kind of like a gatekeeper type of pattern. Metals and mining remain abysmal straight down there. Uh, let's take a look at gold stocks and silver stocks. And then, uh, Susan, we'll look at the GLD for you. Um, first of all, let's take a look at the gold stocks. If I can find them. Here we are. Okay. You don't want to bottom fish here because they're in a pretty serious downtrend. Yeah, they're kind of scraping these major, major lows. But for me to get excited, I want to see the mother of all turnarounds and then play some pullbacks along the way. One of these days, we're going to see the mother of all bottoms in gold. Okay? That's just not, that just hasn't happened yet. And as I preached, I think last week and week before and week before, and even talked to my, um, and mentioned it quite often to my peeps, you certainly don't want to, the silver gives you a great example of why you don't want to bottom fish because they look pretty low right here, and then what happened, bam, they took out those lows. Okay? And it's something, especially like gold, if you look at gold, the commodity, okay, you're like, oh, well, gold's low, man. Look at this. It's way down here at these levels. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty low. I think I might bottom fish and get some gold. Well, if you back the chart out a little bit, in fact, let's look at a weekly chart, okay? And I drew this in last week. Gold could easily drop down to where it was in 2005, 2006. We could easily see $500 gold. Okay, well, I say easily. It might take a while to get there. Or it could bottom out and go back to make new highs. But, Dave, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Well, what I'm saying is, yeah, it looks like it could be bottoming over the somewhat intermediate term, over the four or five-year bottom. But never forget to put things in perspective and look at things from a technical analysis standpoint. And, sure, we could go back to the 05 lows a goal. Absolutely. Okay, um... Utility is one area kind of hanging in there. Uh, bonds have come right back. So utilities kind of hanging in there. I wouldn't buy them just because they're hanging in there, but they are kind of hanging in there. Drugs, um, I don't have a, a live chart on drugs today. But drugs are kind of another area that's hanging in there. That's biotech. Let me see if I can find drugs. Don't take that sentence out of context. <laughs> Just kind of hanging in there, but you can see the bow ties are kind of turning down, so it's losing a little momentum. For the most part, though, most areas look pretty ugly in here. Um, Semi's a good example of that. Double top, double bow tie, second mouse signal. Okay. First one really didn't trigger. Second one now triggered, and it looks kind of ugly. And then finally, let's take a look at bonds. Um Remember, I was a little worried about bonds. They were making a bow tie look like it could roll over. We noticed that the bow tie never really did trigger, and then it went right back up. Okay, so so far bonds have uh, recovered. Okay, GDX, GDX, Jay. We, let's open it up for uh, individual stocks now. And if you don't mind, one stock at a time per line. Uh, gold, the gold miners. Uh, if anything, this is a short. Unfortunately, they're kind of oversold to be shorting them. Uh, you want to short a more efficient market. Of course, these are gold miners, but anything commodity related in general, you want to try to catch it coming off of major highs, kind of like the energies just did, as opposed to catching a short down towards the lows. Okay. EQR for Mr. James. Okay, it's a REIT. Um, well, my only problem is, on a short side, usually you want to see them crack right away. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's going up for nine days. I still think it's a trouble. It's still a bow tie. But usually on the short side, you I like to see only a, a day or two bounce. And I'm a little bit lenient. I mean, I might go be a little more lenient than that, I should say. But in general, I don't want to sit around and wait and wait and wait and wait for a longer pullback. Or I should say, once it pulls back day after day after day, I tend to 
ignore the setup and look for something that um, would trigger after a day or two. Because if it triggers after a day or two, then the most amount of people are trapped on the wrong side of the market. John wants to know about EQM. EQM. No. Um, it's all over the place. Uh, I mean, I hear you. It looks like it's fall. It's it's not a short now. If you were short, maybe so. But yeah, I mean, it looks like a top, but it's not. It's not set up. APTS. APTS. Oops. I accidentally added a uh, APTS. I don't know. That's mentioned. Said it was mentioned by Warden. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what he said. He must have a different methodology than me. Uh, this looks. It's a little too thin, and it's just all over the place. I don't get it. Um, did I transpose a letter? That's got to be the wrong stock. ETP for James. Um, I hear you, James, but it's an energy stock. And what are energies doing? They're going down. So why is a stock walking on water? I don't know. Uh, if we were in a rip-roaring bull market and energies were going higher, then I'd say, by all means, good eye, nice work. Let's give you a high five, okay? So it looks okay. Um, and I can see where it's just, it looks like it's really just starting to get accelerate higher in here. But yeah, absolutely, it looks okay, but let me interview myself. Would I take it? No, because energies are going the wrong way, okay? Robert says, SKX and recent upside moves. I know you blame it on the analysts, but in the AV, you point out how retail is one of the strongest sectors. Should this be taken into account in addition to how bad the chart on individual stock may look? Well, Skechers is not retail. Skechers is consumer non-durables, okay? So, and, and yeah, sometimes you get those kind of, yeah, there's kind of a gray area between, uh, like Michael Kors or something like that, I guess. Um, well, retail's kind of hanging in there, but I wouldn't run out and wouldn't rush out and buy retail. I mean, take a look at uh, RAD, which we are short. That's a retail stock, okay? And the reason we shorted it is because the pattern was there. It rolled over. It looked like it was in trouble, okay? And so far... So good on that. So sketches, I like the pattern. Like I say, like I often say, sometimes two out of three ain't bad. Okay. Sometimes one out of three ain't bad. If you get one thing working, if the setup really, really looks good, then sometimes it's okay to take the setup, even if the overall market isn't fully cooperating. Okay. Sometimes it's okay to take the setup if you really like it. And that's what I liked in Skechers, okay? Um, but, yeah, retail. now keep in mind that retail only came back over the last couple of days, okay? Uh, last four days, it, it's come back. But it sure looked like it was in trouble prior to that. So um, that's another thing, too, if you are looking to retail. Consumer on durables. See, consumer now durable is kind of hanging there but beginning to roll over. So it's kind of like the bigger they are, the harder they fall um, when it comes to that. And the other thing, too, is read the go-go no-mo uh, strategy. I know you've been away for a while uh, from my methodology, but um, – and you're coming back in, right? Uh, or do I have you confused with someone else? Let me think. No, Robert, you, you're fairly new to methodology. Okay, never mind. Uh, but do read – yeah, either way. All right. One cup of coffee tomorrow, Dave. <laughs> Looks like the coffee works just as good or, or better than the Mountain Dew. Come to education, go to free education, and then go down to um, Go Go Nomo. One way to find it would be Go Go Nomo. Let's see. Go Go Nomo. Right here. Click on Go Go Nomo. And you, it's a shorting strategy for high relative strain stocks. So something like Skechers is a high relative strain stock, and it could be a fad stock. Okay? It's like. Um, I remember, not that I want to confuse the issue with facts, but I remember, like, kids couldn't couldn't wait to get their hands on some Skechers, okay? And then uh, about a, a year ago, I heard, um, overheard my teenager daughter said, yeah, that's old people's shoes like Skechers. So somehow they became old people's shoes. So 
with the go go nomo, you don't necessarily try to factor in the fundamentals, but what you're looking for is you're looking for something that that could have could have been a fad. Okay, just like in the IPO, you're looking for something that might become a fad. So what's the story? Like I said, what's the story? Fad of glory? Like, are they going to cure Ebola? Are they going to uh, Ebola? Are they going to cure that? Or, or are they going to cure some hard disease, world hunger? Or, or are they going to make some really good burritos? You know, what's the story? It, it could it be a fad? Well, that fad, fads are great. I love fads, but when they end, they usually end badly. Okay. So this may be a case of a fad ending bad, and we'll see. We'll see. We don't know yet, okay? But, yeah, Robert, you, also, you always want to – you do want to look at the, um, the underlying sector when you're making a decision. Uh, this one's kind of all over the place. It is, a, it is a, um, a foreign stock. But, yeah, James, I agree with you. It looks like it's in trouble. Uh, it's getting a few days of the pullback. After a few more, I might uh, ignore it. A little wide and a little longer term, though. You might be able to find something a little bit cleaner. Andre wants to know about a penny stock. S I A F. S I A F. Uh, it's not even coming up on my screen. Yeah. Well, no, it's um, so it's a penny stock. Bitta short on a retrace. Bitta. Uh, possibly. Sure, it's rolled over. Uh, the question is, should you short on a retrace? Maybe. Uh, you know, it looks like it's kind of has ran its courses, which somebody in here who has an English teacher told me it's the proper way of saying it. Amgen, I'm probably not going to like. Amgen's a big, thick stock. Um, HV, fairly low, about 21. Kind of defying gravity, though. I certainly wouldn't short it, but I wouldn't go long because it, it's made no forward progress in what? Uh, let's see if we can get the thing to come up over here. And uh, since about a month and change, okay, that's just all of September and like a week or so of October. So no, I would not want to. Um, I wouldn't want to go long the stock. ERY was set up nicely with a bow tie from the bottom. Would it still recommend staying away from this type of leverage fund, even if you cannot short? Um, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I'm. I'm um, I'm writing a chapter on uh, the problems with ETFs, and um, I've always I know that um, I know that they have a horrible tracking error, especially with leverage ETFs and especially with inverse ETFs, and it tends to exacerbate itself. So you have a tracking error. No matter what, it's impossible to perfectly track an index. And then when you add leverage to it, it exacerbates that tracking because they're tracked day over day. And when you're doing the inverse thing, it gets even worse. And it's 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 kind of a it's kind of tough to explain. I mean, if I walk you through an example, it's it's the old uh, it's kind of like the drawdown thing. If it goes, it's tracking day to day prices. So if it goes up one percent, then goes down one percent. If you're tracking those then it's like it would have to make back 1.1% to come back to break even, and then you end up with a decay. So, yeah, it's very dangerous. Um, if you're going to trade these, just stay in, in them for a few days, or better yet, just day trade them, okay? I hate to say day trade, but if you are going to, that's fine if you're going to day trade. Uh, leverage shares are a bad idea. We talked about this last week uh, because... Your, your stop has to be three times as wide, so it all comes out in the wash. If you want to day trade them, then, you know, okay, intraday bow tie here, sell short here, uh, intraday bow tie here, buy here, and then just get out by the end of the day. Ride it all the way down, ride it all the way up. I know I'll make it look easy. It's not that easy, okay? So, but, but no, don't trade them. Okay, bad idea. Does ARC look promising? All right, let's see. ARC. ARC. Uh, it's a little bit on the thin side, not too, too bad. No, uh, it's got to get past its prior peak in here. I don't like to trade stocks as they're approaching their prior peak. It could turn into a double top or something. Uh, wheat and corn could bow, okay, wheat and corn could bow tie over next month. All right, let's take a look at that. You might be on to something there, Phil. Yeah, okay. When, earlier I just showed you the euro. 
Now, one thing I left out of that conversation was that it is a very efficient market, okay? A lot of people in there fighting it out in something like the euro. So, and if you go in and watch my stock selection webinar or the IPO webinar, I spent a lot of time talking about inefficiency versus efficient markets. Inefficient versus efficient markets. So without going into a lot of detail on that, and I know it's kind of boring to go through all that, but I think it's very worthy. So if you could stomach it, get your big cup of coffee and sit through my lectures on that, and I promise you it will be worth your while. But just know that in a currency, a lot of people are fighting it out. You've got hedgers, you've got speculators, you've got one-lotters. Uh, you've got a lot of people fighting out. So in a currency, where do you want to trade them? At least, in, at least, and I hate to say, I hate when people say, in my opinion, it's like, what, do you give opinion of others? You know, it's like, but in my opinion, uh, you want to be looking to make some trades when they're on the fringe. When they're making those all-time highs and it looks like they're rolling over, like right here, okay, that's where you want to try to get in. Why? Because this inefficient move is possible, okay? Dollar versus yen would probably be a good market to watch now for a possible rollover at some point, okay? Now, let's get back to your commodities. So this is, I think you've actually, you're on to something there. Uh, who asked about that? Phil. Oh, I love Phil. Well, I love him because he's a client. I love him because he knows what he's doing. Um, but, yeah, this would be a good market to watch for a bow tie. you got a little bit of overhead resistance right here. But that might be an okay problem to have. It is a commodity. You do have to be a little more lenient. But it does look like it's, at this point in time, it does look like it's made its turn just yet. So wait for it to bow tie up and then make a decision. But absolutely, that could possibly work. Corn. Now, corn's a little bit better looking. Corn looks like it's going to push through this overhead supply before it triggers. So, yeah, keep these two on your radar for a longer term, um, or keep them on your radar for a possible position that might trigger longer term. Okay, what am I saying? It, uh, 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 something that might trigger a week or two from now. STRP for Andre. Yeah. Kind of thin, a little extended, kind of thin, but I, I hear you. Um, yeah, just too thin. I mean, way too thin, but I hear you. Uh, I'd like a little bit more pullback, though. Maybe if it was if it pulled back to, like, below 14, because the pullback's a little too shallow based on the magnitude of the move. Novotel, probably not. Probably not. The reason it's going to be too, too, too thick. Oh, maybe I'm confusing them with another wireless company. Uh, no, just too wide and loose longer term and all over the place. I'd rather something more cleanly. STR, a couple people asked about STRP. Interesting. Good eyes, but kind of thin. NXPI, both high from all time highs, was an uptrend. Is it a short? As a short. Is it a short? NXPI. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you do have a lot of support back here, and this might have been on the Landry list recently, and that's the only thing I didn't like about it if it was on the list. If it wasn't, then it should have been maybe, um, or it got taken off because of this. So the problem is if it triggers, it's going to go to 60 and maybe stop there. That's the only problem with that. Uh, ideally, sometimes they look a little better if you have the trend that looks like this and then like that as opposed to this um, – thing here. So yeah, shorter term looks great, but uh, longer term, a little nervous, and it's already triggered, okay? So I'd avoid that for now. I hear you. G dot on the long side, G dot, G dot. No, um, you just got this one big up day here, okay? And now it's just kind of pulling back within an up day, kind of wide and loose. No. No, I don't see anything to get excited about there. It's true about when it resumes its move above 24. Uh, no, because, well, it's, it's um, I don't want to give away too many patterns here. No, it would have to make new highs and then pull back. Let's just leave it at that. PBA short now, is it too late? 
go for a PBR right about now. Uh, maybe on a pullback. I mean, I hear you. It's certainly broken down and triggered and, and bow tied and done all those other wonderful things. But yeah, maybe on a pullback. It's, it's, it's gonna, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not doing that, Phil. He wants me to cover Ford for Don. I think we ran off. I think we ran off, Don. I got one less problem without you. <laughs> I bet he's, he's lurking in here somewhere. Hey, Don, I got one less problem without you. Uh, you see, the problem with this is it's just a one-bar breakout. It kind of drifted a little higher, and he announced come back in. And then also, it's kind of lost a little bit of steam. Even though it looks like it's breaking out, it's lost a little steam so far. I don't know. It's just not jumping out of me. Also, by the way, the market's kind of rolling over here, in case you hadn't noticed. So be careful with that. Tesla, almost bow tied and pulled back from a new downtrend. TSLA. TSLA. Yeah, um, again, it comes back to the, I prefer a chart that looked like this and then rolled over as opposed to this kind of um, roller coaster type of trading. I, yeah, I'd leave it alone. It's, it just bounces around too much. It's a little dangerous now. APT? Andre asked about that one twice. Uh, well, let's break it out, maybe on a pullback. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to do with it now. So, yeah, maybe on a pullback. It looks kind of extreme and extended and kind of thin and volatile. So let's um, let's talk about that after the pullback. Target on USO. USO is kind of all over the place, okay? Um, but I would say if you need a target, I would say that you've got a multi-year range in here. Um, it could come back down to, let's say, 30 bucks a share, and we're not that far from there now. Okay, uh, one of these days I've got this exit here. One of these days you're gonna have the mother of all buys in, in oil when it takes out this long, 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 long range, and uh, get ready to make three times your money when that happens and when it sets up. But that might be a long, long time from now. Write it down though, in case I get hit by a beer truck. Okay, kind of watching my carbs, so that's why I'm thinking about beer so much. K and X. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of truckers. Um, it really didn't get past its prior peak in here, and the volatility is a little low. I mean, I hear you, and I see it's pulled back a little bit, but its pullback is all the way to this, almost just above this prior little high in here. It looks okay, but I would pass. I, I, I'm, I want a little bit more volatility in my setups and a little bit more acceleration. ETP? ETP? Isn't that like a pregnancy test or something? Yeah, we talked about this one. Okay. Yeah, we talked about Tesla. CTV? Uh, on a pullback, maybe. Okay. Um, I can't go into details, but let's just say on a pullback. SWKS. SWKS. Um... This stock looks like it's on a, it, it's kind of a, a pioneer first thrust type of pattern. I don't like the gap back here. Um, I'd almost like to see that gap filled, but oh, it sure looks like it's in a lot of trouble. I mean, you know, I've been preaching to you the whole time. Look for something that's at high levels, just rolling over, and that certainly qualifies. Um, I just would prefer it not to have this gap here, and it's got a little bit of a base here. And it's, all, it's already triggered that micro first thrust. So if you are short, then stay short. But, yeah, that stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. I mean, it, it looks like a $30 stock. FLWS. FLWS. Looking at SPX appears to be confluence of 20 SMA. April high doesn't mean anything. Um, well, it looked like it went. Well, let's, let's take a look at this one first, and then we'll get, go back to the spiders. Um, yeah, this isn't set. It's kind of thin, and it's not really set up. It's just kind of traded sideways in here. It would have to pull back, and if it pulled back, it would have to. It would end up probably pulling back too far. This prior little breakout. Uh, this might be, as you heard me talk about before, a box stock. My methodology is not to be all end all. One thing I have observed is sometimes you get a box stock 
Fortunately, sometimes these box stocks occur after I get in them, and that's a beautiful thing. By a box stock, and we're going to have to wrap it up in just a few minutes, but a box stock, it, it forms a box, and it breaks out of its box, and it forms another box, and it keeps doing that, okay? My methodology doesn't always work with these. Sometimes, though, you get a pullback, and then it goes into a box after box, and that's great. These boxes are the Darvis uh, type of trading that I often talk about. All right, SPX appears to be confluence at 200-day moving average. All right, let's take a look at the P's, SP, S500. Uh, one thing I've been pointing out is that in the P's, if you've been reading the column, which I'm guessing you have, um, if you look at the 200-day moving average, you'll see that it's right around 1900, okay? And then what else is right around 1900? The prior little low in here, okay? So that looks like, a, uh, as I said a few days ago, it looks like a chip shot. It looks like the next stop for the market. Uh, appears to be confluence of 200 SM in April high. April high? I don't know what you mean by April high. You're talking about right here? Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, sure. Um, support once, resistance once broken becomes support. So, yeah, that's fine, um, which is right above, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so 1900 would be a good resting point for the market, and if it got much below that, I would start being concerned. So, yeah, good eye, Howard. Uh, congratulations. Good eye on that. Well, look, um, we're at an hour and a half and change, and it gets a little hard to process these recordings after that. So let's go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, as usual, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate you taking time. You're busy to be here. I love doing these shows, as you can tell, and, and I learn a lot in the process. So from anything, if anything, it's a selfish uh, a selfish thing that I do here. But uh, I appreciate you guys coming. I'm flattered. So uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, any unanswered questions, you know the routine, daviddavelandry.com. Thank you so much.